we welcome you to the Priscilla R. Tyson Cultural Arts Center for our conversations and coffee today, the ninth day of the month of February 2023. I'm Ellen O'Shaughnessy, coordinator of the program. We're delighted to celebrate Black History Month with Sarah Richard, Executive Director of the Kelton House, Museum and Garden, huh? one of the sites of the Underground Railroad, amazing site. And we have with us also Pamela Hamilton, impersonating Harriet Tubman, a slave become free who herself led as many as 70 other slaves to freedom. Sarah Richard will be sharing with us the story of Martha Hartway, a freedom seeker. Freed slaves and Rosetta Armistead, who did not escape slavery, but whose life is a story to be told. 586 Town Street is the address of the Kelton House, built in 1852. How many minutes do you think it is between here and the Kelton House? Very good. I looked it up on MapQuest. <laughs> it's three minutes away. Ah, and we want to know one another better. Hmm? Our Cultural Arts Center was built in the Civil War, 1861. The Kelton House was a site of the Underground Railroad along with 20 other places here in Columbus, including the Hanby House in Westerville, the Livingston House in Reynoldsburg. We're most grateful to you, Sarah, for being with us from the Kelton House to tell us the amazing stories of the Underground Railroad. And Pamela Hamilton, producer of your own show, Diversity Forum, on community access cable TV, having theatrical experience regionally with the, the King's Arts Complex, we're so grateful to you for bringing to us the life of Harriet Tubman, who led the amazing, heroic, and creative journey of freeing slaves through the Underground Railroad. Dylan Long, senior from Indianapolis, who could not be with us today, was part of the Juneteenth celebration here in Columbus last summer and written up in the Columbus Dispatch. He's created a board game of the Underground Railroad. The Freedom Walk. And our family has journeyed this Underground Railroad with this amazing game and learned so much about this historic time. So if you'd like to order the game, let me know. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Pamela, for being with us on this journey of the Underground Railroad, so familiar to our environment here. We celebrate freedom and equality that this Black History Month of 2023 calls us to. Thank you, take over. We're so eager to hear from you. My name is Harriet Tubman. My real name was Araminta Ross. I was born in Maryland, Dorchester County in 1820. And my life was so full with my daddy being in charge of teaching me things about the moss on the, tr on the trees and the North Star, which is what I used because I believed in God so deeply to take people to freedom. We didn't have GPS, <laughs> I, which I learned about later on. Up in heaven, we have all kinds of conversations about <laughs> what's your, your political scene is a mess down here. But at any rate, uh, Lincoln and I talked about it this morning at breakfast. Um, so just to sh uh, shorten this, because really, this nice lady here, she's going to 
give you the in, in, information regarding the Underground Railroad. But I was a key person that took people to freedom. It was not an easy thing. We didn't have no cars and Jeeps. We had to go through the woods and we were led to abolitionist houses. The Quakers were the first abolitionists and others that would hide us in their farms and in their houses and then we would make passage on rivers to get to freedom and Philadelphia became a main place where we would go. And I would also take people to, on the train to Canada because of the Fugitive Slave Act. But I just wanted to just very quickly say hello to you this afternoon and I'm so glad and happy to be here. I did bring, this is a memento because I was wanted for taking slaves to freedom. And so there was always a price on my head. Now just a little bit more that you may not know. During the Civil War, I was a scout, a spy, a nurse, and Lincoln tried to hold out on my pension. He didn't want to free the slaves either, but I had a long talk with him. And so he came around, and so he's, he was a different man after he met Harriet. So with that, I want to turn it over to this magnificent, fascinating lady here who's going to give you more information about the Underground Railroad. I tend to have to stand up when I talk, and I'm going to move my chair so I don't trip halfway through. So thanks for coming today, and I'm glad to see so many faces here. And I'm extremely uh, happy that Ellen called me and uh, invited me to be here. And this is one of my favorite things to do is to speak to audiences about the Underground Railroad and the anti-slavery movement. Uh, just a little tiny bit about myself, because sometimes people see me and they go, I don't understand why she's so fascinated with African American history and the anti-slavery movement. And I kind of, I, I, I don't want to say I fell into it, but I, I originally worked uh, outside, of the, outside of Chicago in a town called Lombard, Illinois. And I started working at a museum, and we had three sites. And one of them, uh, one of our sites was an Underground Railroad site. It was run by an abolitionist named Sheldon Peck and his wife named Harriet. And every time a school group came, I had to explain it wasn't Harriet Tubman. It was Harriet Peck. And so Harriet Tubman had never been there. And once we got that settled, then we could move on with our, our time and talk about the anti-slavery movement. And very quickly in my career, decade and a half ago, I was told that, or I was asked the very important question. You talk about Sheldon and Harriet Peck, and it's wonderful that you do, but where's the African-American voice? Where's the freedom seeker's voice? And we, we said, as a staff, we have one voice. We have the Peck family. This is their home. This is where he worked. This is where he lived. And so we don't want to make up history, but this is the history we know, and this is the history we have. And then we were told to look harder. So the stories of the freedom seekers were at the Peck House, but we didn't have those stories. So after years and years of research, um, because it's, you know, it's very difficult to find freedom seekers' names and information and stories about them, we found people, we found their stories, and we were able to talk about their stories and bring that story to life. And so we don't talk about the Underground Railroad as a very one-sided abolitionist point of view. We also want to make sure we talk about the freedom seekers because that is the story we want to tell and we want to highlight. So coming to Columbus, Ohio, fast forward to 2000 or to 2020, uh, moving here right in the middle of COVID, which has been uh, quite interesting. So I moved here during COVID, and we talk about the Keltons, and we t talk about Martha Hartway. But there's so many stories that we can talk about. So 
I created, uh, the research had begun, but a lot of the things that we do is I want to make sure that there's, my goodness, um, excuse me, there we go. Uh, so this is uh, our original programming that we do at the Kelton House uh, about, uh, the Colum about Columbus, and so, and this is things that I've researched myself and have all primary source documentation to go a part, a part of that. So just wanted to uh, put that out to begin with, that this is all original research, and um, that's all coming in the past couple of years. And I always want to uh, talk about the people that I work with and work for. And one is Dr. Mary Olerman, who's been our education coordinator. She's been around for a long time, 20 years, talking about Martha Hartway and Sophia Kelton at the, um, and she was one of the people that helped with our, or planned our Underground Railroad Learning Station that we have where we talk to about 3,000 students a year. Um, the Junior League of Columbus runs the Kelton House. Uh, the Columbus Foundation owns the building, but everything that's done there on the site, preservation-wise, programming-wise, everything is through the Junior League of Columbus. We are their number one project and their longest running project. And so if you wanna learn more about that, um, uh, we are a great resource for that. And then finally, my favorite, I love maps. I'm a map person, and I think it kind of puts history in perspective. And so Nicole Bergman is a professional graphic designer. She's also our uh, executive vice president at the Junior League. And the map that you see today, she was able to take pieces and parts of maps that are scanned at the library that are all torn apart. And of course, the tear is right at the Kelton House. Really, you know, so of course it's going to be that way. So she was able to, as a designer, put it all back together. So I have one uh, graphic that I can show you all. So, and I wanted to thank them. But now, the radical history of Town Street. Town Street, uh, as you know, so we're at Main Street, uh, just, uh, what is it, two street, one street over is we're at Town Street. Town Street, um, the history of Town Street and the people that lived there are so amazing. Of course, back when you start, um, there was nothing there until they built the School for the Deaf, which is now the Topiary Garden. Around the corner, they built the School for the Blind, which is now the, the Health Department, and then they built a road in between those two places. As soon as they built that road, then it was like, wow, we can build houses here. So that's how things started growing out there. The Keltons, when they built their house in 1852, it was the very last house on the east side of Columbus. There was nothing else. So if you can imagine, that was forest, that was, uh, that was kind of a little bit of wilderness and they wanted to get out of Columbus. So as they're building out to that direction, they started kind of in the city of Columbus and then they moved way out to the country on Town Street. But they started more to the city and the people who lived there early and, and then following um, to where the Keltons lived and to their, uh, their people on the outside of town, this is a... I like to call it, it's a hotbed of radical abolitionists. So we're talking about this, there's this fervor of people coming together in Columbus, and you have a fervor on the other side too. There's people who didn't want slavery to end, and you have the uh, anti-slavery people. And it's, in my research, I'm finding that there's this concentration on Town Street, because many times like people with like minds want to live next to people who have the same beliefs and the same core values, and that's how Town Street was. And there's Town Street. So of course, we're gonna go back to this map multiple times today, so you'll see the yellow line is Town Street. And I I'm just finding out now that my little pointer does not work on the TV. So, so if you can see towards the center here is where the, uh, the state capital is, the river, and so you, you kind of get where we're coming. And so we have Rich, Friend Street, which I believe is Main Street, and so we're down here now, currently. I would have expanded my map if I, um, if I was a little more prepared. But So that's where Town Street is. Of course, the Kelton House is at 586 East Town Street, and this map, for your reference, is about 1856 is when this map was created. So this is right at the time we're talking about. So for Fernando Kelton built the house with his wife, Sophia, and he had six, six children, well, five children. The sixth child was born at the house when they built this in 1852. So this is what the house currently looks like. It's been a museum since 1976. 
Well, we know Fernando was an, part of the anti-slavery movement. Now, can I say he was a radical abolitionist? Probably not. Can I say he was an accidental Underground Railroad site? Maybe. Was he advertising? Uh, obviously not, because nobody advertised the Underground Railroad. But, um, you know, it's a secret network of people. So when we talk later about Martha Hartway, we talk about how did she end up there um, as a freedom seeker? How did she know? We'll talk a little bit about that. But mainly what I want to say is that we know Fernando Kelton was anti-slavery for two major reasons. One reason is he's hosting anti-slavery meetings at his office. His office was even closer than the Kelton house. His office is right around the corner where 3rd and... Um, Third and Rich Street is now. So right around the corner, we have his office. And in, at his office, he's hosting things like meetings to stop um, the Nebraska Act, which would expand slavery into Columbus or into Nebraska. And so he's meeting with his friends. Now he's meeting with A.P. Stone, who happens to be his brother-in-law and lives next door to him. He's meeting, uh, so F.C. Kelton was also there. Another person at the meeting was Sam Galloway. We'll talk about him in a second. Other people who are attending these meetings to stop slavery, Goodell, I'm, ass I'm assuming you all recognize the name Goodell. He's also anti-slavery and showing up at these meetings. F.C. Kelton, A.P. Stone, I mentioned him. Eli Gwynn was Kelton's, um, he was his landlord. Now, these names may not be familiar to you because these are not normal names we talk about with the Underground Road. We talk about the Hanbys. We talk about uh, John Ward. Um, but some of these names may be un uh, unfamiliar. But we, again, we know they were anti-slavery because of the meetings they were going to. They were going and actively putting their names on things to say, we don't want slavery to expand. So one of the people at that meeting was Sam Galloway. Sam Galloway lived right across the street from Mr. Kelton. That's the larger point on the map. Sam Galloway lived in this great, beautiful house. I think it was torn down in 1956. But it was um, this great, beautiful three-story house. It looked a lot like the Kelton house. And the Galloways and the Keltons were friends. They lived across the street. Their friends were actually, or their, their families were joined together generationally. So Sam Galloway, he was... Very interesting for a couple of reasons. He was a U.S. congressman. 1855 to 1857, he was a congressman. So he's staying in, in Washington, D.C. His wife is here, and his wife allowed him to run for one term, and she goes, I'm not going back to D.C. Those people are crazy. I'm not going back. We're staying in Columbus. So he only served one term as congressman. But he was there during a really interesting political time. Ms. Harriet mentioned how our politics is crazy now. 1856, we have South Carolina Representative Preston Brooks nearly beating to death Charles Sumner, Senator Charles Sumner, because over the issue of slavery. So what's going on is Charles Sumner stood at a meeting in the Senate chambers and he said, you like slaves, you like slaves, you like slaves, you like slaves, called people out by name. And when he said that, it made a lot of people mad. So the people on the other side came back the next day, and Rep Rep Representative Preston Brooks was a little annoyed because Mr. Sumner, the day before, had called his cousin some really bad names on the, on the Senate floor. So he nearly beat him to death with his walking stick. And so that's what's going on in the Senate in 1856. So Sam Galloway served his two terms. He said, I'm not going back. But he made some really good friends while he was, he while he was there. One of his friends was president. He wasn't president yet, but Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln is said to come to Columbus three times in his, um, well, twice when he was alive and once when he, he was already dead. We believe he might have stayed at um, Sam Galloway's house because they were close personal friends. As the gentleman entered the room, Mr. Lincoln arose from a seat, advanced to the door, wrapped Mr. Galloway in his arms with the exclamation, God bless you, Sam. I would rather see you than any other man in America. Now, this happened at a really important meeting in the Oval Office while President Lincoln, for the very first time, said, I want to do this thing called an Emancipation Proclamation. What do you think? 
So the people who were in that room at that time talking to President Lincoln was Sam Galloway, Governor David Todd, who was the governor of the uh, great state of Ohio during the Civil War, and the Secretary of War Stanton. So those are the people in the room when this, the Emancipation Proclamation came up for the very first time. So we know that Sam Galloway had some definite anti-slavery ideas. Governor Todd, we're not quite sure exactly. We know he had some, he was an anti-slavery Democrat. We know that. He's, he ran as an anti-slavery Democrat. But because he was part of the Democrat Party, which was traditionally pro-slavery, there were some issues of was he all in. And the question was, ah, he was probably three quarters there with the idea of anti-slavery. But he lived just a couple doors down from the Keltons. I think it was three doors down then. It's about five houses down now, currently. And this is where he lived at 530 East Town Street. That house is still standing. Now, the Keltons and the Governor Todd were very, um, very good friends. And he asked, the letter to the right was written by uh, Fernando Kelton to the governor. And he, in jest, calls him His Excellency in this letter. And then he invites him over to his house for that evening for a social party to discuss the history of the Four Kings. And if you're familiar with the history of the Four Kings, that was to come over and play some cards. So that's what he was asking him to do. So the whole letter was in jest. But in 1863, he's friendly enough with the, the governor of the uh, this great state of Ohio to come over and play cards with him at his house. So we have Mr. Kelton's house. Again, Mr. Kelton's house, we have uh, Governor Todd, Sam Galloway. This is where we have uh, Kelton's first house. So when they first, uh, the Keltons first got married in 1841, uh, they built this house at the corner of 3rd and Rich Street, or kind of in the middle. And then at the, the actual corner of 3rd and Rich Street, uh, there's an empty lot there now and a statue, I believe, of a fireman um, is where his office was. It was the corner of the Gwynn block. Remember, Eli Gwynn was going to anti-slavery meetings as well. And in this office building at the corner of 3rd and uh, Town Street, excuse, 3rd and Town Street, was uh, three people who were in there uh, working their offices, which was H.H. Kimball, another anti-slavery guy, of course, Keltons, and A.P. Stone. Now, I mention all of these places and names, not because you need to remember all of them in your life, but to point out the fact that the Underground Railroad was a network of people. Nothing was done in a bubble. It's a network of ways to get from one place to another. Now, if a freedom seeker was coming uh, to Town Street, maybe they didn't have a name of where to go, but maybe they just had a place or a name of a street or something like that. So this network and this cluster of people is really important in the history of the Underground Railroad. Now we're going to talk about Rosetta Armistead. Now, I can't believe that she's not more of a household name. She's amazing and wonderful, and this is not her. But I see this, pic this portrait by Thomas Waterman Wood that was done in 1858, and I imagine this is what... Uh, Rosetta Armistead looks like, and I always want to put a name and a face together. So, um, but this is uh, a portrait of a market woman in 1858. So I wanted to put that out there first. Now Rosetta was born on a plantation in 18, 1839 or 1840, and she was born in Virginia, in Williamsburg, Virginia, and she spent most of her time at this Id idyllic place called Sherwood Forest. I'm sure it wasn't that idyllic for her. It was owned by President John Tyler. President John Tyler had over 400 slaves. He was the only, well, I'll get to President Tyler in a second, his professional life. But President John Tyler had two different wives. His first wife was Letitia Tyler, and she was... Um, she was the mother of eight children. Her youngest child was Alice Tyler, Alice, Den Alice Tyler Dennison. Shortly after Alice's birth, Letitia died, and maybe, uh, I think maybe a decade later, um, Mr. Tyler, President Tyler remarried. 
But he served uh, as vice president under William Henry Harrison, our very own William Henry Harrison, and he became president after Harrison's death, if, if you can remember your history. Over 400. He owned over 400 slaves. You're welcome. He became, um, he, he became president after Harrison's death. Now, if you remember, Harrison died 39 days after he took office. He died of pneumonia because the story is he spoke too long at his inauguration. He caught a cold, which turned into pneumonia. 39 days later, he passed away, and President John Tyler was never elected president, never re-ran for president, and he took office in 1841. He was the only Confederate president we ever had. He was disowned by the Whig Party. He ran, you know, he was originally a Whig. They said, you know, you're out of here because we are anti-slavery and you clearly are not. So he, he was disowned by the Whig Party. His wife died when he was in office. He remarried again while he was in office. And there's a really interesting story about um, Henry Armistead, who he took to the White House as a slave. Notice the, the name of Armistead. Um, as a relation to Rosetta, not sure if it's a brother or a cousin. And John Tyler's mother's maiden name was Armistead. So if you put all that together, many times in history, people were uh, enslaved people were given the names of the people that owned them. And so that's where the name Armistead comes from. So, the horrors of slavery. I mentioned Alice before because when she was a young woman, she got married and she was given a wedding present of Rosetta Armistead. Now, if you can imagine this, her father, John Tyler, gave Rosetta Armistead, a human being, to his daughter Alice as a wedding present. The couple moved, uh, Alice and her new husband, Reverend. Uh, the Reverend Dennison, they moved to Louisville, Kentucky, taking Rosetta with her. So Rosetta had to then leave her parents, Maria and Bertel, who lived on the plantation, had to leave her brothers and sisters, who all lived as a family unit at Sherwood Forest. But she was taken away from them and taken to Louisville, Kentucky, where the Reverend Dennison became a pastor. Well, the Reverend Dennison, the, or the uh, Alice had a baby, named her Betsy, uh, her name was Elizabeth, named her Betsy, or called her Betsy in 1852, and in 1854, Alice died. So after Alice died, then they're like, her husband is way too important to raise his own child. What am I going to do with a child? I'm going to send her back to Virginia to live with her grandparents. So baby Betsy, as a two-year-old, went back to Virginia and lived with her uh, grandparents. And then it was like, well, who's going to take care of the baby? And this is where the story gets really crazy. They were going to then send Rosetta Armistead back to Virginia to take care of baby Betsy in 1855. So the big move days comes, and they decide that Rosetta's going to go back, and there's a guy named Dr. Miller, who's kind of inconsequential to this story, but I'll still mention him. Dr. Miller said, I'm going to Virginia. I'll take her with me. She can, she can go on the ferry with me. So as an agent of her owner, remember, Reverend Dennison now owns Rosetta Armistead, his agent... Dr. Miller is going to take her to um, take her to Virginia. So they get on a boat, and of course, then the boat uh, on in March 14th, I believe this March 10th, 1855. They get on the ferry. They're heading from Louisville, heading to Virginia. The Ohio River is blocked by ice, and they have to get off the ferry. So they get off the ferry, and then he's like, "Well, what am I going to do? Okay, I'll take a train." So the train had two options, either go through Zanesville, Ohio, which he knew was a hotbed of anti-slavery activity. He's definitely not going there. Well, I'll go to Columbus. It's a big city. I can blend in. Nobody will notice Rosetta. Because in 1840, and the reason this is so important, 1842, Ohio passed a law. One of the best things they did, or one, of, one thing that, especially for Rosetta, had one of the biggest impacts, 1842, he passed, they passed a law that said if an enslaved person is brought into the state of Ohio by their owner or agent, they're automatically free, period. That's all it took. You just had to be brought here. So that's why I was very clear in my introduction that she was never an escaped slave. The Fugitive Slave Act 
did not apply. She was not a fugitive. She was brought here by this guy, Dr. Miller, as agent of the owner. So anyways, they get here. They arrive at uh, Union Station here in Columbus, Ohio in 1855. And he's thinking, we're just going to go in, go right back out. He doesn't realize until he's on the train that there's going to be a layover in Columbus. And not only is it just like, oh, we're going to stop for a couple of hours or stop till the next morning, because the next day is Sunday. Trains don't run on Sunday. So he can't take the train on Sunday, so they're here till Monday. As the train pulled into the station, just as it pulls in, Rosetta gets a tap on her shoulder by a guy named William Ferguson. He taps her on the shoulder and says, you know you're free here in Ohio, right? Of course, she's 16. She's a very intelligent girl. She has no idea uh, what power she has, but she probably knew she was free. She probably knew a lot of things because everything that's said about Rosetta Armistead, that she was a really intelligent person. She was smart, smarter than the average 16-year-old, and even though she had been enslaved her entire life, she had... Uh, a sense of being to her, a sense of carriage that she had a presence to her, and she was intelligent. So she probably knew that she was free in Ohio. But did she know she had any power? Probably not, because she'd been enslaved her entire life. So William Ferguson tells her this, and they get off the train car. Of course, they are not riding in the same train car with all of the white people. So she's not with Dr. Miller at the time. So Dr. Miller gets off his train car. Rosetta Armistead gets off her train car. They join back together, and they walk off together. And William Ferguson has her followed. He has her followed by two of his um, people from his church who happened to be on the platform at the time. His church was the African Anti-Slavery Baptist Church, and that's where he went. Uh, that's the church he founded, which, oh, by the way, I didn't mention... He lived right around the corner from Town Street. He lived at 4th, 4th Street, right behind, um, ju just about behind where Kelton's office was. But William Ferguson was a founder of the African Anti-Slavery Baptist Church. Another founder of that church, one of the founding members, was John Ward, as well as Reverend Poindexter. Now, this was a new church that was founded in the 1840s. I think 1847, and it was, it was because Second Baptist Church, which is currently on 17th Street here in Columbus, divided. Now, it wasn't a divide that destroyed the church. It was a divide that just created two churches. The, se the Second Baptist Church, they said, we want to talk about Jesus. We want to talk about the Lord. We don't want to talk about politics in church. But there was 40 of their parishioners that said, we have more things to talk about in church. And so they founded the African Anti-Slavery Baptist Church. The church eventually joined back together in the 1850s as uh, their ideals joined back together. But they built this church, and of course, where do you think they built it? On Town Street. The corner, it was between uh, six, 5th and 6th Street on Town Street. And I think I just said all those things that are on the slide. But some of the members were John Ward, John Booker, William Ferguson, uh, Jeremiah Freeland, James Hawkins, David Jenkins, and William Washington. These are all people who were proud members of the African Anti-Slavery Baptist Church. Now, we take a moment to yes. see if anyone may have a question. Yes. Oh, well, he's got a question, question for sure. sure. That last, uh, I can, uh, that last the line, that, uh, and you come into it. Is the, um, is that uh, Baptist church, is that still around? Yeah. Okay. No, that, uh, the Second Baptist is there. Testing. Yeah. Somebody else have a question? Yeah, but the Second Baptist Church is still around. It's on the it's on Seventeenth Street, um, near uh, near Broad, and um, so that's where that currently is. And but the hospital over there on the Grant Hospital, that's kind of that whole area. That's where we're talking about. Um, 
Harriet and I were talking earlier about the waterways in Ohio. I think it was around 1840 that the, what do you call it, the Erie Canal. Eventually, there was a waterway from Portsmouth all the way up towards Lake Erie. Right. Did the freedom seekers get on any of those waterways? Do we know? Do we know? No. Do we assume? Yes. Is it something that Wilbur Siebert talked about? Probably. And I don't have those answers. So uh, Wilbur Siebert's always my go-to person for information. Um, if you haven't read uh, Wilbur Siebert's book, it's a fabulous place to start. Um, he received letters about over 200,000 incidents of the Underground Railroad, not quite in real time, but starting in the 1800s. He even talked to Miss Harriet. Yes, so. Miss Harriet, let's hear from you for a moment. What a been, I could see the expression on your face as Sarah was talking. Something profound. Something profound. I just want to thank you today, <laughs> Miss Ma'am, for illuminating so much history about Columbus, Ohio, that I'm sure the majority of you did not know including Miss Harriet, myself. Well, well, you are from the East Coast. I am from the East Coast. I know you asked me had I ever been to Ohio. I don't remember having been to Ohio. But to have heard the history that is that abounds here in this place, in this city. And I want everybody to get over to Kelton House and check it out. I was just there a few weeks ago myself. Thank you. And so uh, this is all very important during this time and this age that we are in at this time. To, this is a special thing for you to be here today to be treated to this history and information because that is how we will grow as people, human beings, and as a society. Thank you, Ms. Harriet. Oh, yes. He will bring you a microphone. So it's all recorded for us. All right, just, just a quick question. I see these fine homes that Kelton and Galloway had. What, what was their source of income or money or? to get those yep. homes built. Sam Galloway was an attorney, and uh, Mr. Kelton was the first wholesaler here in Columbus, Ohio. So he was the first one. He was kind of his Amazon of the time. He had not only a bricks and mortar store, he also delivered. He had wagons that he delivered with, and he sold fine dresses, fine shoes, lumber, bricks, all of those things, and then he delivered as well. And, but he was the first wholesaler, so then he could sell to other places as well. He had a lot of legal partners, um, or a lot of partners for his business that he worked with, and one of them was A.P. Stone. He also worked with John Field, and they were all under, or they were all anti-slavery people as well. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned a gentleman named Poindexter. Yes. Any relationship to the history of Poindexter Village? Yes. So James, Reverend James Poindexter was born, um, his heritage was, I believe he was Shawnee Indian. He was uh, of African descent and he was of white descent. He was born into slavery and he came to Columbus, I think in the 1830s, he came here. He was um, a barber by trade and he became a, a reverend and he was founder of the seven, uh, Second Baptist Church as well as the African Anti-Slavery Baptist Church. Uh, what I find most fascinating about him, which we'll get to, he had his barber shop in the Neal House. The Neal House was one of the most prolific anti uh, underground railroad sites in Columbus, right across the street from the State House, right on High Street, across from the State House, and that's where his office was. So every person of importance in politics came across the street and had their hair cut by the Reverend Poindexter. And he literally had their ear. 
He literally could talk to them about politics. He learned from them. He was an intelligent man, and he was educated before he came to Columbus. Now he's here as a, as a barber and a reverend and a community leader. He's the first African-American to hold public office here in Columbus, and eventually they named Poindexter Village after him. So that's where the name comes from. So back to the Harriet, gosh, no, back to the Rosetta Armistead story. So this is where it gets legal and I find really interesting. So William Ferguson has Rosetta Armistead followed. He then goes directly to Sam Galloway's house. So he goes to Reverend, um, I forgot where I was in my slides, sorry. So he goes to Mr. Galloway with Mr. Galloway, remember Kelton's neighbor, he goes to Mr. Galloway's house and says, I need an attorney, we need a writ of habeas corpus because somebody's being held against their will and I know where she is. So they go to a judge, have the, the judge sign off on the writ of habeas corpus and by Sunday morning, they're filing, or they have the writ signed by the judge that says she's being held against her will and she needs to show up in court at 9 a.m. Monday. They have the paperwork signed, and this is within 18 hours of her arriving. Sam Galloway and William Ferguson get this done. He shows up at where Rosetta's staying, which is at Dr. Miller's brother's house. They show up there, and they said, she's coming with us. Here's the legal paperwork. And this Dr. Miller's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you just let her stay until her owner gets here? And he's like, no, he can meet her in court. But... Um, that he can show up at court and he can talk to her and all of those things then. So eventually, uh, Re Reverend Dennison arrives from Virginia. And when he arrives in Virginia, or from Virginia, Reverend Den wow, that's wrong. Reverend Dennison arrives from Kentucky and tries to convince Rosetta, you have this writ of habeas corpus, you can go to court, you can talk about all these things, you can try to get your freedom, but let me talk to you first. If you get your freedom, you will never see your parents again. Your parents live on the plantation in Virginia. You will never see your parents again. You will never see your brothers and sisters again. That life you had with baby Betsy, you will never see Betsy again. And she goes, ah, I think I'll choose my freedom. So she goes to court the next day with her attorney, Sam Galloway, Congressman Sam Galloway. Remember, this is 1855. And the court, the first thing they say is, you need to have, that's the, that's the original courthouse. I couldn't find a better picture. Um, goes to the court. The court said, yes, because of that law from 1842, she gets her freedom. It's clear as day. No worries. But she needs a guardian. She's only 16 years old. We can't just let her out in the streets of Columbus because she's 16 years old. She needs a guardian. So who do they appoint but a guy named Louis Van Slyke? And where does Louis Van Slyke live? On Town Street, of course. 188 East Town Street, right next door to Kelton's office. So he lives there, and that's where Rosetta is, kind of kitty corner from the African Anti-Slavery Baptist Church. Well, things start bubbling up in town. There's stories of the members of the African Anti-Slavery Baptist Church who show up to guard Louis Van Slyke's house at night to make sure she's safe because they know this is not going to go over very well, especially with the powerful Reverend Dennison from Louisville, Kentucky. But at 9 a.m. that Monday morning, it was made legal. Uh, a crowd of 900 African Americans show up at the courthouse to find out that she got her freedom. And Judge Jameson said, absolutely, she gets her freedom. And this is only two days after she arrived. So from two days, she goes from being on a train, heading to Virginia, and now it's two days later. She's living with some stranger, Louis Van Slyke. She's gained her freedom, and now what is she going to do after that? But the question is, she's gotten her freedom. The Fugitive Slave Act doesn't apply. She's never been a, I mean, she was never a fugitive. We talked about that earlier. So hooray. But there's a problem. First, she needs a job. She's here. She has a place to live with uh, Louis Van Slyke. She starts working at this guy's office as, um, as his assistant. Remember, I told you how smart she was. She's living, uh, at, or she's working at Dr. Coulter's office um, as a assistant. 
And if you can see, that's right on the other side of the State House. So she's working there, and two weeks after uh, her first court case, what happens is these two gentlemen, I say, loose, I say loosely, two gentlemen come into the door and say, oh, we're sick, we need a doctor. So they walk into the door, they, Dr. Kelter welcomes them in, starts to show them to his exam office, they pull out their guns out of their pockets, and they said, we're taking her with us. And he said, I, what authority do you have to take her? They said, well, she's going, we're marshals, we're taking her because she's going to Cincinnati, and all the authority I need is this gun in my hand. So immediately, Dr. Colt, she's out the door with these two marshals by the order of the, her former owner, Reverend Dennison, and they're out the door and they are heading to uh, Cincinnati. They're heading to the train to go to Cincinnati. So they're very close, so they're heading back to Union Station. But what Dr. Coulter does is the most important thing, is that he gets to Louis Van Slyke and he says, Louis, this is a problem. They just took her. He goes next door, he sends one simple telegraph to Cincinnati, Ohio, and says, we have a problem, and I need you as an attorney to meet us on the train station. So he sends the, t the so Louis Van Slyke, the guardian, goes next door and sends the telegraph to Cincinnati to his colleagues there. He runs to Union Station, jumps on the last train car as the train's pulling away. So he's now reunited with Rosetta, and they're both heading now to Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, of course, Cincinnati's very pro-slavery, so this is why the owner, Reverend Dennison, wanted it tried in court again in Cincinnati. And that telegraph went to Salmon P. Chase. Salmon P. Chase was the governor of Ohio at one time. He was secretary of the treasury, founder of the Republican Party, who, which he founded specifically to end slavery. And he, was chief, he eventually became chief justice of the United States. Not a bad guy to have as your attorney. Also, in 1845, he also had um, received a testimonial of gratitude because he filed the same, he won the same kind of court for this writ of habeas corpus uh, in 1845 for somebody who was brought into Ohio. So he's done this before. So now he shows up at court and he brings a young colleague with him, Rutherford B. Hayes. Who's also, who's also native of Ohio, born in Delaware County. He's a young attorney. He was living in Delaware, and his uncle's like, you're never going to make it as an attorney in this little town of Delaware, Ohio. You need to go to Cincinnati. That's where all the action is. So Rutherford B. Hayes goes to Ohio, or goes to Cincinnati, and he launched his career, and he became famous because he had, first they fought, they went to state court, and state court was very clear. 1842 law, she's free, and she, it was very clear. Then they filed suit in federal court. Federal court in Cincinnati wasn't too kind. There was a gentleman, a judge there named Judge Pembry, who not only um, heard this case, he heard one other very famous case, and I'll tell you in a second. But at the very end of the, the court case that Rosetta Armistead is at, remember this is a third one now, First of all, she um, had her court date in Columbus, and she was given her freedom. She then goes to the state court in Cincinnati. She's given her freedom. Now she has to fight with her new attorneys for her freedom yet again in Cincinnati. And Judge Pembry says, well, you know what? She's probably not free, but you wrote the warrant wrong, and by a technicality, Judge Pembry gave her her freedom. For, for good this time. Yay. So by April 4th, 1855, those final two judgments came down, and she was given her freedom. Now, what's a little, uh, a little bit of the rest of the story, as old people like me, Paul Harvey, would say, whatever happened to Rosetta after that? Well, she did not stay in Ohio. A woman read her about her story in the newspaper, and she wasn't a local woman. She was a woman who lived in New England, and she read her story. Now, this story was written not only in the anti-slavery newspapers of Columbus, the pro-slavery uh, 
newspapers barely picked it up, but the anti-slavery newspapers in Ohio picked up the story. It was also picked up, and Frederick Douglass wrote about her case as well in his newspaper. And this wealthy woman in New England happened to read her story, and she said, you know what? I'm going to take her and have her educated in the best seminaries in New England, and so she can start her new life there. So that's what she did. She didn't stay long there. By 1870, she's a school teacher back in Virginia, living with her family. And so after uh, the 13th Amendment, she kind of got her cake and ate it too. She got her freedom in 1855, and then by uh, 1865, she had her freedom in Virginia as well, and was able to go back and live with her family. So by 1870, she's, uh, she's teaching in, uh, in Virginia. But I love this little end part. By the way, Im imprisonment in Cincinnati will amount to a sum not much short of $1,000, all of which will have to be paid by Reverend Mr. Dennison, because they did arrest the marshals that took her in Columbus. Who so they went to jail. She got her freedom, and Mr. Dennison had to pay for everything. So, so this is a wonderful story of how people across Columbus and the state of Ohio came together to help one girl in one case, and it had larger implications. Martha Hartway is the freedom seeker that we uh, talk about at the, at the Kelton House. She arrived in 1864 with her 13 or 14 year old sister, uh, arrived via the Underground Railroad and she not only stayed in 1864 as a young, uh, young 10 year old who escaped from Virginia uh, to find her freedom, but she stayed at the Kelton House in 1864, 13th Amendment, 1865, and she stayed yet still. She stayed as part of the family and she did not stay in the servants' quarters. She shared a room with the Kelton girls, and she stayed there until she met her husband in 1872. His name was Thomas Lawrence. He worked at the Kelton house, and they eventually met. They got married by the Reverend Poindexter in the front parlor of the Kelton house, and they met and married there two years, and then they stayed for another two years as a married couple in the Kelton house, where they eventually um, were given money by one of the Kelton girls to buy their first house across the street from the Kelton girls. So, but this is a picture of Martha here in Columbus uh, later in her life. Uh, and since I mentioned Second Baptist Church so many times, her son was the first African American to graduate from Ohio State Medical School, one generation from slavery, and now he's a doctor. And he was the choir leader and clarinetist at the Second Baptist Church and they were members there their whole lives. Do you have any responses there? Let's hear from you. <laughs> Just amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing. But what this teaches us, what this teaches us is that we are all on our journey full of lessons and one never knows how things will work out. But what you must do is believe and pray and continue and walk and talk and share and love each other because we are all human beings here on the planet and life is so short. Again, I want to tell everyone, because I'm just here visiting, you know, I have to get back on my spaceship to go back up oh, yeah. shortly that you should all be getting the information so that you can go over to the Kelton House and find out more information about the history of Columbus, Ohio. Don't you cherish what she has said today? You didn't know and I didn't either. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I have one commercial. So you're welcome. Thank you. I just have to let you know we are open Thursday through Sundays, noon to four. We're open for open tours. So you can come at noon, one, two, or three, and you can get a tour. Uh, our prices are all online. And so you can come and do that. So hopefully every year in September, there will be more information out there to highlight the history of the Underground Railroad specifically and all of the people involved in helping with that. So there we go. Pamela? 
and Harriet. Harriet, right. <laughs> AKA General Mose. And Dylan Longs uh, with us through his wonderful Freedom Walk game. Um, the, uh, I want to tell you, as we bought that game and played that with our family, my son-in-law was kind of teaching us how to do it. And I pulled and said, buy a slave? I don't want to buy a slave. He said, yes, you do, Gammy, because then you can free the slave. <laughs> it was a wonderful moment. I, and this game is a teaching moment. So let's, uh, let's say again, another round of applause. The spirit of what you've brought to us is so beautiful.